All right, so we're in Leviticus chapter 18 through 20. Probably we may get to 20 tonight. Um, of course, 20 is extremely brief. Um, but anyway, so we'll start in chapter 18. First off, notice that God is again speaking to the people through Moses. Uh, you're going to see this as a continual pattern. And again, we established the reason why last week. Why is God choosing to use Moses? Why not Aaron? Why not one of Aaron's sons um, in the priesthood? <clears throat> uh, yes. You said that, and what? I didn't write it down. I'm thinking it, maybe it's because Moses is the only one open enough to, to go before God. Because when God came, or God made it, so mm-hmm. he was going to come down and speak to all his people, because mm-hmm. that's what they were wanting. Mm-hmm. And when he came down, everyone was scared and ran away. Mm-hmm. So then God's like, okay, I'll speak to Moses, mm-hmm. and Moses will speak to you. Yeah, and, and that was it. Partly it was a decision of the people. You talk to God, hear what he says, tell us what he says, and we'll, we'll go forward. Mm-hmm. That's part of it. And what else? Um, I had to do something with the priesthood because he wasn't a priest. Yeah. He was, he was, of the, he was a Levite, but he wasn't a priest. Yeah. He wasn't, you know, to, he didn't offer up. Yeah, so why, did, so why did that qualify him to hear God? No, it was, it was something because he was... He was a prophet. A, yes, that's, that's it. Right. Thank that's you. It. I couldn't get that out. He was a prophet. <laughs> he was a prophet, which made him the eyes and the ears of Israel. There you go. That right? Mm-hmm. So they Moses heard and saw God on behalf of the people, but on behalf of God, he was God's mouthpiece. Right? Mm-hmm. So, and I told you last week that... Uh, the two things that Moses was, that were, there are two, really there are two positions that largely are not um, compatible with one another, and that is being a leader and being a prophet. They're, they're really not compatible at all. A prophet comes and yaks at people and walks away. They don't lead anybody. They, they're the mouthpiece of God. They say what they've got to say, and they leave. Um, leaders have to stick around. And uh, so, you know, he was a leader, um, shepherd, as you, you use the term, Doris, uh, um, uh, of Israel, right? But he also was a prophet. And so uh, he had to do both and. It was a very tough job. There are very few people in history who have fit, uh, fit both positions of being both a prophet and a leader. There have been several, but very few. Uh, you're usually going to be one or the other. And Moses was an extraordinary man. Um, of course, one of the things that qualified him was the fact that he was at that time period on the earth, perhaps even the way all the way up to, until today, except for Jesus Christ, um, Moses at the time anyway was the most humble man on the earth. The Bible tells us so. So um, we have on good authority, a.k.a. the word of God himself, he looked down upon the entire earth and said, that guy, Moses, is the most humble, living human being on the planet. So uh, that qualified him to be used, didn't it? Remember, God resists the proud, but gives his grace to the... uh, So I imagine he had a lot of grace he could pour out to and through Moses. Amen. So first off, notice that God, again, is speaking to the people through Moses. He is a prophet and is therefore the mouthpiece of God. He does not use the priests or the elders of the tribes of Israel, but Moses specifically. We begin with a very clarifying statement which puts to rest two major false teachings in our days, um, in today's churches, and all of the odd thinking that springs out of these two teachings. Uh, So let's read the uh, verses 2 through 5 in Leviticus 18. Speak to the Israelites and tell them, I am the Lord your God. Do not follow the practices of the land of Egypt where you used to live, or followed the practices of the land of Canaan, where I'm bringing you. So, in other words, where, I, where you left from and where you're going, don't follow anything that they did. Be right? In the world, but not of the world. In, but not of, right? Okay? Where I'm bringing you. You must not follow their what? Their customs. Their ways. You are to practice my ordinances, and you are to keep my statutes by following them. I am the Lord your God. Keep my statutes and my ordinances. A person will live if he does them. I am the Lord. 
Now, there are many today who teach against the Old Testament primarily on the ground of two misconceptions. The first one is that a testament is the same thing as a covenant. It is not. A testament is not the same thing as a covenant. When we say the Old Testament, it does not mean the Old Covenant. Are you following yeah. me? The Old Testament, the way we use the term, just means all of the writings from Genesis all the way to Malachi. That's what the Old Testament is. It's the writings, right? All the writings that God did before the Messiah came, right? Now, those writings were under... No, well, actually, not even all of them were under the Old Covenant, but they, they represent, inside of the, the New Testament, the old, I'm, I'm sorry, inside of the Old Testament is contained information about the Old Covenant. A covenant is an agreement between two people. It's the terms of a relationship. Are you understanding? That's what a covenant is. Two people will strike a covenant, and it becomes the terms of their relationship. That's a covenant. So the Old Testament contains the terms of God's relationship to Israel and Israel's relationship with God, but that's not all the Old Testament is about. Are you following me? All right? The Old Testament shows it being lived out, but the actual covenant is only mentioned in a few places. In fact, the book of Leviticus is one of the primary places were the old covenant, meaning the terms of the covenant. If you do this, I will do this. If you are unclean, you must offer this. These are the terms of our relationship. Are you following what I'm saying? That's the covenant. But all the other writings are just talking about how God interacted with man and how man interacted with God before the Messiah came. Are you following? In fact, a lot of the Old Testament contains information that predates the Old Covenant. Isn't it true? Yeah. I mean, did we read about Adam and Eve? Well, yes. that was before the Old Covenant. Well, didn't we read about Noah and, and, and uh, the offspring from him? We read about Abraham and, and, and Isaac and Jacob and, and the, the 400 years of bondage that they were in Egypt. All that is not Old Covenant. The Old Covenant hadn't even come up yet. Right. Are you following me? Right. So to, to link the two together is a very huge misconception. Is everybody with me? Yeah. Okay? That's the, it's wrong on every level. There's reasons why people have made that leap. One of them is from a passage in the book of Hebrews. And, but the problem is, again, people don't study to show themselves approved. The writer of the book of Hebrews deliberately used the word testament as a play on words of what Jesus did by talking about the fact that the will that someone writes out cannot come into effect until the guy that wrote the will dies. Right? right? And it says in the same way, the will of Jesus Christ is the new covenant that was made in his blood and it couldn't become ratified until Jesus died. And he was really just making a play on words. What Jesus cut was not a, testify, a, testima, um, a testament. What he cut was a covenant. The writer of the book of Hebrews knows the difference between the two. You can tell that if you read the entire book. He was just making a play on words that you and I will miss because we don't speak Greek and Hebrew. The Hebrew language had a word that was made for covenant. But when they translated all those Old Testament writings into Greek, there was no Greek word for the word covenant. It didn't exist. So they had to use the word testament. Testament. Don't look at me funny. That's the truth. There was no word for covenant in the Greek. There were two words that came close. Testament actually was not the closer of the two words. But the reason why they did not use the word that was the closest is because of the fact that they would not dishonor God because the word that came the closest was an agreement that was struck between two equals that was the terms of their relationship. That was closer than the word they chose, but because they refused to use any word that indicated that God and man were on an equal playing field. So they would not use that word. So they chose the word testament instead, which includes notions that are not accurate. Are you following? But it's the best they could do. It's the only word they had at their disposal. Well, through the years, you can tell how that can dilute people's understanding.
Does that make sense? But in all reality, what they we have in the Old Testament, we have the entire Old Testament, and in it is the Old Covenant. But the Old Covenant and the Old Testament are not the same thing. One contains the other, but neither one are the other. Are you following? Yeah. Okay? That's extremely important. And on the website, I will give you a link. I found an article written by R.C. Sproul, who is now with the Lord as of this year, um, that was excellent on this particular topic. I'll leave a link on the website for this message tonight that you could follow and read it. It's like one or two pages long, but it will give you a lot of understanding about this topic that I'm not going to go into tonight because it's really not the point. But I am saying, the reason I'm bringing it up tonight is because of the fact that this statement that is made at the beginning of this chapter is huge, and it diffuses two major lies that are taught against uh, across pulpits all the way across this world right now. And if you can uproot the, those lies, you'll be, you'll be in really good stead for understanding Scripture, especially in our day and age. One of the first things, like I said, is that they mistake the understanding of covenant and testament. Number two is they believe that the Old Testament was influenced by other cultures, either initially from Ur the Chaldees, from which Abraham came in the first place, or whether it was from um, Egypt because of their time there, or when they went into the Cana land of Canaan, they were influenced by the people of Canaan. And that's why there's some things in there that we just have a real hard time with in our day and age. And it really wasn't God's idea. It's just that they were influenced by other cultures. Are you following what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yes. But if that's true, then the scriptures are not inspired. Hello? Right. And listen, hold on, please hold on. <clears throat> listen to these words. He says, reading verse 2 through 5 in, uh, in Leviticus 18, Speak to the Israelites and tell them, I am the Lord your... You'll notice all the way through these chapters, I am the Lord your God shows up a lot, doesn't it? Yes. And it is primarily, though not the only reason, but it's the primary reason for their obedience and the primary reason why he's the one that's got the right to make the commands. Right. It's because I'm the Lord your God. Mm -hmm. Those are two different things, by the way. There's God, meaning I'm creator, but I'm also Lord, meaning your immediate master. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yeah. God's everybody's God. He's everybody's creator, but he's yeah. not everybody's That's Lord. Right. right? And he says, I am the Lord, the master your God. Yes. Okay? Yes. This is why I'm telling you to do this. And by the way, this is why you need to do it. Mm -hmm. right? right? Now let's keep on going. Speak to the Israelites and tell them, I am the Lord your God. Do not follow the practices of the land of Egypt from which you used to live. Or follow the practices of the land of Canaan where I'm bringing you. You must not follow their customs. So that tells me anything that I read that God tells them to do, God's making a distinction saying, what I give you is going to be different than what they would tell you. Mm -hmm. So if we read it under the Old Testament, these words that we're reading are not other people's customs that the Jews took in. These are the words of God, and in fact, it's the very thing that made them stand out from all the other nations because their customs are so radically different than other nations. Are you following me? And the fact that we and the fact that we've got a clear testimony of what God's words actually are is clearly seen as you continue to go through the Old Testament because when the Israelites began to get rebellious against God, they did not want to keep what this said. They wanted to conform to the customs of other lands. Are you following me? Yeah. Which tells me that what this written here in these books is not the customs of other lands. Exactly. Right? Or otherwise, they would have been perfectly fine with it. They wanted to forsake what is written and start doing what other people did so they could be like them. Right. Which tells me, what's written down here is not like them. Right. Is somebody with me? Yeah. So this is very, very important. Go ahead. I've, I've got to finish this because there's a well, lot I'm, more to this. I'm just saying that this says the same thing. It's I know. It's amplified and it corrects what, you know, exactly That's good. what you're saying. That's excellent. That's very, very good. The misunderstanding concerning covenant and testimony comes from using terms interchangeably, and that's a problem. Um, and also, but um, then the secondary issue is a problem because the fact that um, I, I had this written down someplace, and I gotta find it. Um,
Okay, this means that if the Old Testament sounds like God is telling his people to separate, uh, to be separate and live lives distinct from the world, it was God who instigated that thinking. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Because the Israelites always wanted to be like everybody else. They, they're humans. They want to blend in. Isn't that right? Yes. Humans don't like to stand out. <clears throat> they want to blend in. They want to find a group that they fit into, right? They, and they got, these guys were wandering in the middle of the wilderness all the way around a bunch of other nations, rubbing shoulders with all of them and standing like, out like a sore thumb because they weren't like any of them. Are you following? One of the biggest things that made them different is they didn't have, at that point, did not have a homeland, and they did not have a king. That alone made them ridiculously different than every other nation. Isn't it true? Yes. And they wanted to be like everybody else, right? Also, if the Old Testament sounds like it recognizes and supports a system of authority and government, military, and religious spheres as well as submission to those authorities, it's because it really does. If it sounds that way, it's because God set it up that way. God establishes governments. He establishes militaries. He establishes religious structures. God's the one that sets all these up, and they all have got their own sphere authorities. And, and this guy over here, the king, does not have a right to come over here into the priest's business and tell him how to do his job. He has no authority there. His authority ends at the temple gate. Right. Are you following? At the same time, the priest has no right to go into the king's house and tell him, this is what you've got to do, because his authority ends at the temple gate too. Right. Are you following? Yes. Same thing with the military leader. There are spheres of authority. And you know there are people that look at authority and say, no, 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 we're all equals. Well, I'm sorry, according to the Bible here, we might be equals as far as human beings before God, but delegated authority is something he sets up. Sphere authority is something he sets up, and he agrees with it, establishes it, and expects obedience to it. Amen. Are you following? The, one of the last things is, and I'll mention this, and I was talking to Terry as we were um, um, at breakfast slash lunch today talking about some of this. There's a lady that I know. She loves the Lord, but just like all of us, she loves the Lord with reservations. Just like you do. Just like I do. If we all love the Lord with all of our heart, you would never have to even come to a church service. Are you following what I'm saying? If we love the Lord with all of our heart, we would never even have to, uh, we probably wouldn't have to read our Bibles because you find yourself keeping everything that was written in it. Right? So, you know, so I'm not picking on her. I'm saying that so that we're, I'm putting us all on an equal playing field like that, but I'm just bringing her up, this person, you don't know her, um, this person up, just because of that she sets a prime example of what I'm referring to. Um, she had uh, come to me one time because she had a, a problem with um, her pastor, who I knew very well, um, because of the fact that that pastor supported the idea of male authority. And she didn't know that I did as well. And um, so she came to me, and we were talking, and I, I was trying to set her straight on some issues, and, and she was also coming about the first John 1 9 thing because she's being told you, you don't have to do that anymore. And I'm saying, no, honey, yeah, you do. Um, but anyway, in our discussions, um, she, of course, she had a very bad relationship with her husband, and they separated, and she got all the kids, and she's fighting for custody of, of certain things and stuff like that. And so she's already disqualified for even being able to understand or study scripture in regard to male authority because she's already got a bias. Right. She couldn't see it if she wanted to. Right. Exactly. All right? She's going to have to wrestle that demon to the ground before she can ever have eyes to see. Right. Just like you and I do. Does that make yeah. sense? If you and I go to the Bible with the bias, I promise you, you're not going to see what the Bible says. You're going to see what you're going to see. You're going to see in the Bible what you want to see. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so she was disqualified for seeing the truth anyway. But I tried to help her. But she, but she had written off the Old Testament as hopelessly patriarchal. Yeah. Right. And, but the only reason why is not because God is patriarchal. It's because they were, they were, being, um, they were just uh, living by the customs of their society. And I said, no, honey. I said, their society was Jewish. That was their society. Mm -hmm. Do you know who created Jewish society? God did. Right. <laughs> I said, if you read all the way through the Old Testament, God is speaking to the men, and he's commissioning the men, and he puts the men in positions of authority. All the way, it wasn't man that did this. This was God. So if, in order for you to believe what you're believing, darling, you have to believe that the Word of God is not inspired. 
You can't hold on to God's word is inspired and hold on to the idea that this is all just the customs of men and they only did patriarchal things because they were living in a world that was hopelessly patriarchal. Are you following? You can't have both. Either the word of God is trustworthy or it isn't. And if it isn't, I don't know why we're having this conversation anyway because why, why even ask me a question about a book that you don't even trust? What's the point? Right. right? right. So, you know, but this is, believe it or not, this is a huge issue in the body of Christ. Yes. I'm talking about, it is huge. Yes. It's huge. Yes. It's everywhere. Yes. And they really do believe somehow they're able to marry the idea that, well, the only reason they made these rules is because it was part of the general society of the world. But, you know, God's really not that way. They can hold on to that and hold on to the notion that it's all inspired at the same time. Somehow, I don't know. In the same way that people can somehow claim that they're Christians and believe the Bible and say, well, well, I believe that maybe evolution may be true, and maybe God used evolution, and, and, and maybe a day is really like a thousand years. Because you know the Bible says a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. So maybe that whole thing, it all fits together and meshes together just fine. And, you know, and all that garbage. Are you following? Well, they clearly aren't following their Bibles at all. Right. Amen. Amen. Obviously, that they can't. Uh, they even turn their brain on for just a microsecond. They'd have to realize that if evolution were true, then there was death before Adam even showed up on the planet. And the Bible tells us that death entered this world through Adam. Right. So you can't have evolution being true. Right. <laughs> you can't because you had, according to them, millions of years of life and death, life and death, and life and death before man ever crawled out of out of their cave. Right. Right. So clearly. You can't hold on to biblical truth and evolution at the same time, but Christians do it all the time, or they think they are. Yeah. Are you following me? Oh, yeah. We've got to be, when you become a Christian, it's not when you turn your brain off, it's when you turn it on. Yes. Hello? Yeah. Don't check your door, your, your brain at the door. <coughs> so it's important that these, so if you ever have someone tell you something like that, you need to go back to this passage right here. Following in Leviticus, Leviticus 18, 2 through 5, God says, you will not follow the customs from the land that you came out of or the land I'm bringing into, but you're going to follow my customs. So if it is a Jewish custom or a Jewish tradition, guess who made it up? God did. Hello. Yep. This is very, which is why, by the way, Paul praised Gentile Christians because they were keeping the traditions that he had delivered to them. Yes. What traditions could he possibly be delivering to them? Jewish ones. Yes. Hello? Yes. So this is important. Can you understand why this is important? Yes. Can you understand that if you just got those two things alone, you could sidestep a, literally a, a, a mountain of mis- uh, of false doctrines that are going around our planet right now in this day. Just two simple ones. Just mountains of misinformation. Yes, Doris? Quick question. Uh -huh. When you're talking about the sphere of authority and the priests would stop at the temple and the king, you know, at his palace, whatever, how would that fit if, if one was invited by the other? Rather than You're allowed to go in, but you, it may be, but you can't have authority mean, there. No, I mean, as far as invited to share direction like if the king said okay to the priest come tell me what you know I don't think that ever happened but they could have but there again it would have, that would just been seeking advice the authority would still better rest with the king right okay so and 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 and, and now a prophet they're, they're not asking the time to come take my place <laughs> no certainly not and if he had done that he would have been wrong mm -hmm. and God was still gone with the king at the end for whatever mm -hmm. decision was made because God's going to go with, with the person that he established as the authority, right? Which is why when Jezebel did all the things that she did, who did God come and park all the blame at the door of? The king, right? It wasn't at Jezebel's door because even though she was calling the shots, he was the one that had authority, right? Yes. She'd be uniquely qualified to understand this. When someone invites you over to their house to pet sit, you don't just walk in and take ownership. That's true. Re everything you do in that house represents. You, you check with them, make mm -hmm. sure that they would be okay with it. Yeah, that's right. That's if a good the example. If he invited the priest into into you know into the his his domain, the king still has say. The yeah. priest has to obey. Yeah, Appreciate that's right. That's true. Yeah. That's obey or leave. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you first, and then you go ahead. Uh, 
I, I think that's where the prophets came in because mm -hmm. they were sent and that was usually the king was always after the prophet mm -hmm. to kill him so I don't want to talk him yeah. you know Either he was the friend of the king or the enemy of the king. That's there was no exactly. middle ground with the prophet. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So yes, uh huh. I'm just asking a question. Why That's fine. Is it that, I hate to say this, but it's true. In the Amplified, they make it very clear, and mm -hmm. I don't know why they don't point to this to help people get it. Well, started. it's very clear in the in the King James too. Well, but I mean, in in the fact of what they can and cannot do, the covenant and everything. I understand. No, I know it's it's right there. But you, in order for you to it, to govern your life, you'd have to number one know it's in the Bible. And number two, you'd have to care. And, and that's really not the case in a lot of Christendom right now, um, especially if it goes against their bias. The bias is, you know, they want to be able to do things the way they want to do it. And if you step on that, then they say, well, I'm sorry, that really isn't, that really isn't God. That, that, that's just a culture thing. That's just Jewish culture. It's not to do with the Bible. Anyway, let's go ahead and move forward. I wanted to, I just wanted to deal with that and lay that out because if we didn't do anything else, that, that nugget at the beginning of chapter 18 is huge and it will sidestep so many issues in our lives. It will also keep you on good ground uh, regardless of who you talk to or who you run into. Now, um, uh, let this passage uh, just forever settle those issues in your mind. Now, as we continue forward, you'll notice that... Uh, um, sex is brought up a lot, right? It's pretty clear, right? Now, and, and I, I think that one thing that you'll notice as well as, as we press forward is that on one level of another or another, almost everything that is in chapters 18 through 20 are the things that were told by the Holy Spirit to the Jews to lay upon the Gentiles as a burden. Remember? Because remember, they were told... You have to circumcise and do this and keep the law and do this stuff or Jesus doesn't do you any good. And they sought God and said, you know, what do we do? And the Holy Spirit, and they came to the conclusion that we lay no further burdens on this. And one of the first things they brought up was sexual immorality. Keep yourself pure sexually. Then keep yourself from blood and keep yourself from things strangled. So the three of the major things that are brought up in these three chapters right here is what they told them. Right. Are you following? Now, you also need to understand that by extension, by bringing up sexual immorality, he was really, they really meant the entire Ten Commandments. Are you following? He was not saying, okay, for as Gentiles, you guys cannot commit sexual immorality, but it's okay to steal and to kill and that other stuff. The other tens you don't have to keep. But that whole sexual immorality, now you don't do that, but you know, you can kill and you can steal. That's fine. You don't have to keep the other nine. Clearly, that's not what he meant. Right. By bringing up the one, he was including the other nine. Right. Are you following? Yeah. And that's kind of common sense yeah. that, uh, well, you would think it's common sense, but there's a lot of people that would fight you on that too. Yeah. Um, but, okay, so now, uh, to, I, I, what I chose to do is make this in a synopsis to make it quicker. Okay. It essentially says, these are the people you cannot have intercourse with, okay? Not with family. This includes immediate family all the way down to aunts and uncles, which by extension includes nieces and nephews. Obviously. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay? It also includes grands, meaning grandkids and grandparents. That's considered immediate family. All right? Mm -hmm. All this includes additions to the family by adoption or by marriage. Okay? Right. Yeah, I don't, you can adopt somebody in the family. I know technically they're not blood. Still a no-no. Do not do it. Okay? okay? Um, you cannot marry a woman and her sister, though it could be more uh, um, that particular phrase right there that was used in this chapter. As I was reading it and studying it, there are some people that say that it could be more focused upon rivalry between women rather than specifically sisters. But I think when you get to chapter 20 and it kind of revisits this, it's pretty clear talking about sisters. So in other words, now that the law has shown up, there will be no more Rachels and Leahs. Hello? And we can understand why. What happened with Rachel and Leah? This was a problem. They were rivals. Amen? In other words, it served to divide a home. And God's not for division. Are you with me? Yes. So clearly that was an issue. Uh, you also cannot... Um, uh, uh, the, a general one that's very obvious is not anybody other than your mate. You are not to have sexual relationships with someone of the same physical gender. Mm -hmm. Homosexuality is condemned outright in these passages, mm -hmm. aren't they? Yeah. It is. It's, I mean, it's real clear. 
Um, uh, not someone of the same physical gender. Um, you're not to have intercourse with someone during their menstrual cycle. And you're not to have sexual intercourse with any animal. Right? These are the things that were laid down as, uh, as no-nos concerning sexual practices. And by the way, he said, all these things I'm telling you are the customs of all the lands around you. They all do these things. Good. Every last one of them. So this makes them different then. Yes. Hello? Yes. So they're not... They're, I don't know about you, but it seems like what's happening here is they are in fact not being influenced by the customs of other people, but in fact have their own customs set up by God himself. I don't know. I'm going to go out on a limb here and think that's what's happening here. Right? Okay? I understand that other people may not think so, but I think that the Bible's being pretty clear here. Right? You're going to follow my customs, not the customs of what you came from or where you're going, but mine alone, because I'm the Lord your God. You notice that with the bookends. He starts off with, I'm the Lord your God. Don't do these things because... I'm the Lord your God, right? So it brings it up on both ends, right? Uh -huh. Yes, Terry. <clears throat> um, one of the things, like I said, I brought up earlier too was with you was, um, and again, it's because God wrote his word and his law and his ways on our hearts. So when we yield to what we sense in our Holy Spirit and what Christianity knows in its depths of itself to do, mm -hmm. that's what we find ourselves doing. And you see that played out even more with the the freedom that darkness, so to speak, allows itself to have. Yeah. If you want to know what God wants, look at the opposite of what's happening. That's right. You don't appreciate God and don't respect God. Mm -hmm. And they're playing out exactly the opposite of what he's laying down here. That's right. They consider it freedom. But in reality, I, I, I have a book. I forget the name of it now. Um, but it has to do with uh, um, the human body and how God is seen through the human body. And he has a chapter on bones. And um, that, you know, when you look at other animals and stuff like that, there's some animals that have um, no bones whatsoever. Some of them have a whole lot less or have more cartilage or whatever. And there's... You, when you you look at the bones, bones make human beings rigid. We have a shape, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and that shape keeps us from doing certain things. Like you can't, like an octopus, slither underneath the door. Right. Your bones keep you from being able to do that, right? right? But it is. Uh, but what you don't realize is that the bones, the rigidity of the bones, actually free you to do more than the octopus could ever think about doing. Yeah. That the rigidity is, in the rigidity, is the freedom. Yeah. Are you following? Yeah. Just like, you know, uh, it, you know, the world thinks that, you know, um, if I can just be allowed to do anything I want, that's freedom. But in reality, it's bondage. Yeah, it's bondage. Right? It's the lines really are your friends. Amen? Yeah. The lines are your friends. Yeah. Inside of the rigidity is actually freedom. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, so, and, and Jesus himself made it very, very clear in his statement. You couldn't get much more clear than this. He said, broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way and confined and cramped is the way that leads to life. And very few people ever find it. Jesus' testimony of what is right is that it is confined, it's cramped, and virtually nobody in history ever finds it. Out of the billions of people on the planet, a few hundred thousand find it. Hello? Wow. Not many. Right? right. But that, nar that narrowness is life. And what you think is freedom is death. Yeah. Amen? So uh, these are good laws, Amen. not bad ones. Amen? Yes. I had a question about uh, not marrying your sister. Is that, wasn't there a provision to, to raise up? If a brother died, then you were to raise up. Yes, at that point it became your responsibility. But see, the, this was an issue of while they were alive. Oh, okay. okay. Um, you know, uh, you could not have intercourse with your brother's um, uh, wife while he's alive. And Terry brought up a very good point today that I had missed. Um, I thought it was an excellent point, and that is that every one of these things pointed back to bringing shame on the man, not the woman. 
It's not that the woman wasn't shamed by doing by being a participant, but in these things, it was bringing shame on the head of house. Yeah. Are you following? Yeah. Now, and, and, and don't take our word for it. Go back and read it again with that in your mind. You'll see it popping up off the page. Yes, yes. Amen? Yes. That's, a, that's very, very important. <laughs> okay. It's very important. Now, we're going to read Mark, verses... Yes, uh-huh. Didn't we see that earlier when the daughters went out to see what was going on because they were curious... I don't remember. Uh, I think it was in Exodus. Yeah, it was yeah. Uh, 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 Diana. Oh, you're talking about yeah. one girl. Yes, yeah, Diana. Yes, uh -huh. yes, absolutely. Yes. That, yeah, because, yeah, there's no question. It, it, it eventuated in it. Now, a lot of that shame, those those two brothers, Judah and Levi, brought on themselves and on their father. But, yes, it would have never happened if she just stayed at home like she should have, right? Absolutely. So, good point, yes. Now, um, also, notice, yes. That's okay. This is a clarifying question. Did you find, or is it too detailed to go into um, live, but um, what the difference is? Because sometimes they say to uncover the nakedness, and other times they say to lie with. It's the same thing. It's okay. a turn of phrase. It literally means to have intercourse with. I just didn't know why in the first part they were using all of the one, and then all of a sudden they start using the other. I don't know, unless it was just a literary device. It's kind of like what we do. I mean, there's literally at least a dozen ways of saying have sex. Um, and, you know, you, just probably for no, no other reason than just not saying the word every single time, he may have changed, just mixed it up a little bit. I don't know. But no, the, to, unco to uncover the nakedness literally does mean to have sexual relations on some level. Yeah. Um, also, notice, uh, before we go into verse 24 and 25 in this chapter, that the sins of a people will cause the land to vomit them out. The sins of a people will cause a land to vomit it out. This is what has happened. This is a, God owns this by uh, when he uh, brings... Uh, let me just go ahead and read these two verses here in verse 24 and 25. Do not defile yourself by any of these practices for the nations I'm driving out before you as you go into the land of Canaan, the promised land, the people that are in the promised land right now that I'm going to drive out so you can take that, that as your possession. He says, for the nations I'm driving out before you have defiled themselves by these things. The land has become defiled, so I am punishing it for its sin, and the land will vomit out its inhabitants. Now, what God, what's God saying here? He said, if you, when you go into the land, start doing what they did, the land will vomit you out too. Yeah. And did it not do that? Yes, it did. yes multiple times. Yeah. He brought them into captivity to another group of people, yeah. and the land vomited them out. Yeah. Now, you know, I, God was not simply arbitrarily kicking people off their land and giving it to Israel. That was clearly his choice, and he had... If he had wanted to do it, he could because all the land belongs to him anyway. Right. right? He could have told them, get off the property. I'm going to give you till noon, and then I'm going to start wiping you out because right. I'm giving it to somebody else. He had that right, didn't he? Right. Because all of it belongs to him. Right. This is a big problem, and it's something Terry and I also were talking about um, during lunch. It's something that we, we picked up way back when, and we've forsaken it now, but back when we were in the Word of Faith movement, and that is... The, one of the big doctrinal issues, problems that the Word of Faith movement got off on the right tr on the wrong track, was because they began to assign ownership to man, and that was a fundamental mistake. And out of that sprung a lot of squirrely doctrines. Yeah. And if they kept with the notion that everything belongs to God and I am the steward of anything I have in my possession, yeah. I have heard people we play people. Um, in here on Sundays, years and years and years and years ago, who taught you, don't say, don't dedicate your property to God. Don't tell God, this is your property, not mine. That's your property. God gave that property to you. You own it. You need to take up possession of it. You need to plant angels on all corners of it. You need to do this and, and all this militant stuff about what belongs to you. And the truth of the matter is, all of that's wrong. Right. The Bible never one time says the property belongs to you. He says, it's mine, and I'm giving you stewardship over what I possess. Right. It belongs to me. Yeah. Are you following? Oh, yes. Well, now, isn't that a different mindset? 
One is kind of haughty and protective yeah. and, and, and lifted yeah. up about what I own. Yeah. The other puts me in a position of hupotasso, and I am I'm a steward over what belongs to another man. Right. That keeps you humble, exactly yeah. as you ought to be as a child of yeah. God, as a human being. Amen? Yeah. We're, this, none of this belongs to us. Yes, uh-huh. Uh, in regards to the thought, this popped my head about uh, baby dedication. Yeah. How, how does that... That's devoting. Uh, that's devoting a person's future towards the Lord. So but that's that's. It's not showing ownership. Yeah, because a lot of people say this child is a gift from God. That's right. And so therefore they. At which to which it is, okay. absolutely. Mm -hmm. But anytime we try to assign ownership to anything, we've we've gone too far. We've overstepped our boundary. Now notice that the people do not have to understand right and wrong in order to reap what they have sown. Right. When Israel went into the land to take away the land from the Philistines and from the Canaanites and from the Hittites and the, the, the Jebusites and all these other people, did they have to understand the law? No. They had continued to do something that was wrong, and because they had sown seed, they were reaping a harvest, weren't they? They did not have to have knowledge of it. God, in other words, it didn't have to be sin. It just has to be bad seed. Are you following me? Yeah. There is this is another massive misunderstanding in the body of Christ. There are sins and there are wrongs. Are you following me? Yeah. There's a lot of things that you and I do that are wrong, that are also not sin, because you don't know it. So God's not judging you for it, but at the same time, are you going to reap a harvest? Yes, you put the seed in the ground. All right. I don't have to know that what I planted was watermelon to get a watermelon. Right. If I planted it, guess what I'm getting? Right. Amen? Yeah. You don't have to know. Now, in order for me to be held accountable for it, I have to know. So there's a difference, therefore, between reaping what you sow and punishment. Hello? Yeah. Now, we're not going to talk about that tonight because I don't have time. But I just want you to see there is a massive difference here. These people, God was not coming in and judging them for something that they knew, but he was allowing and working with the land, vomiting them out because they had sown seed. Right. Amen? Mm -hmm. Now with Israel, he was doing both because they knew. Yeah. So he was bringing judgment and the land was vomiting them out. Amen? Yeah. Are you following? Yeah. Now, consequently, this is what caused the Jews to be vomited out of their own land. Just a side note. The scriptures reveal that God takes, pa takes part in this removal from the land. Isn't that right? We see it. Don't we? Yes. You don't just see it with Israel being removed. We saw it when God removed, remember, the very first people he kicked out of the land was the people of the land of Jericho. Right? They walk into the land, and what's God do? He, he shoves the walls down flat. He drives the people out. Right? Yes. So, uh, so... God, obviously, God plays part in this vomiting out, right? Yes. In other words, the land isn't just doing it of its own accord. It's working together with its creator owner to do this. Is that with me? Yeah. You know, also, the Bible talks about how, the, how it's God who guides the stormy wind, right? Yeah. It's God, it says God touches the mountains and they smoke. It's talking about volcanoes. You know, when I see a lot of activity in a geographical low air area, I understand that this is a time of reaping. Right. And, you know, you're probably going to see a lot more in this nation yeah. because we're coming due. Oh, yes. We are coming yes. due. Yes. Big time. Yes. What we got in 9-11 was barely a slap on the wrist. Right? <clears throat> it was a warning sign. It was, a, it, was, it was a Jonah going to Nineveh and saying, repent and sackcloth and ashes, because the next one is not going to be a pop gun. The next one's going to level you. Right. Is everybody with me? Oh, yeah. And so God, God's been faithful and continues to do what he's supposed to do, what he always does, but man has continued to do it, what they always do, too, and ignore him. Yes. And so it's no wonder when we see all kinds of massive tragedies breaking out. I personally, just to be perfectly honest with you, are wondering what was actually going on over there in Hawaii. Yes. 
They've got three hurricanes heading their direction right now in a volcano that still hasn't shut off. Yeah. Why? That thing's been there for a long time without all that stuff happening. Mm -hmm. Are you following? Yeah. Why now? Well, you know, I, I think maybe it's because, you know, God knows what he's doing. Yeah. Are you following me? Yeah. You know, just, uh, this is one of the real big problems. Again, the grace movement would, would literally would shut me up if I were to say that in any of their assemblies. Right. Because God doesn't judge his people. And God, doesn't, God, God doesn't cause hurricanes and God doesn't do this and God doesn't do that. I'm like, have you read your Bible? And then they stick it, oh, that's all Old Covenant. That's all meaning Old Testament. Therefore, because it's Old Testament, it's Old Covenant, and therefore it's all done away with. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, I, and I keep on trying to tell them, no, I'm sorry. No, see, the Old Covenant did not change God, it changed you. The same God that guided the, guided the stormy wind in the Old Testament didn't stop guiding stormy winds just because the covenant changed. Nothing about God changed in the covenant because God didn't need changing. We did. Are you following me? Yeah. And can you see how little misconceptions like that can cause all kinds of problems? Yes? Yeah. So, um, let's go on to uh, verse 26 through 30. But you are, to be you are to keep my statutes and ordinances. You must not commit any of these abominations, not the native or the foreigner who lives among you even. For the men who were in the land prior to you have committed all of these abominations, and the land has become defiled. If you defile the land, it will vomit you out, as it has vomited out the nations who were there before you. In other words, God is not a respecter of persons, is he? No. It's true. Any person who does, does any of these abominations must be cut off from my people. You must keep my instructions. Do not do any of the detestable customs that, uh, that were practiced before you so that you do not defile yourselves by them. What's he end with? I am the Lord your God. Yes. Now, chapter 19. And he, and he has the thoughts about chapter 18 before we progress. So I can just say that with the fires in California, mm -hmm. the floods in the north, and in the Midwest that have been, and the, the floods are still coming in the north. Yep. And along the seacoast, the, the people are losing their <clears throat> lands and houses. Yeah. All, and, all and, you America. Know, um, the hurricane that went up the coast of Florida last year that did a lot of damage also was a warning to our area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It didn't hit our area, but it was a warning. Yeah, you, ever, you ever heard about a... Um, uh, shooting a shot across the bow, right. you know, mm -hmm. it's a warning shot. Yep. The next one's going to actually hit you. Yep. You know, that's what this was. Yes. You know, and I was seeking the Lord during that hurricane thing. You know, God, what is it that the people of the, you know, I can understand it down here in Miami. I can understand it in Orlando. I can understand it over here, but, you know, and certainly in Tampa, but I don't understand our area, you know, and, um, and the Lord's like, you know, um, have you not been paying attention to how much, Passivity there is in Manatee County, among other, among other things. Other, yeah. But one of the biggest problems our county has, that Christendom has in Manatee County, is lethargy. People are not excited about the Lord. I'm born again, but they live a nominal, non-excited, tame Christian life. They're, they spend their time asleep. Most of the time. All, and, 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 and it doesn't matter who you are. I'm telling you, when you're in Mandy County, you've got to be deliberate to stir yourself up. I've been in other areas. I've lived in other places. And it's not like that. But I remember when I went away to college. When I came back, I could have told you when I hit Mandy County, the border rug, without even looking at the roadside. Because you could feel it spiritually. There was a spiritual oppression that hit you when you got into Mandy County. Now, granted... It was, uh, it was a little bit of a lift as well because you had to drive through Tampa to get here. And Tampa was horrible. But getting to Mandy County, it was almost like someone pulled a blanket over your head and put a pacifier in your mouth. And I, I've, I've long said to people that doing ministry in Mandy County is like trying to run in knee-deep mud. Yes. That's the truth. It, it's just not easy to do work here. It's hard to stay awake yourself, much less to lead other people in being awake. It's just the way this area is. And God's like, I did not die for passivity. So it was, you know, that was a shout across the bow. Judge yourselves, right? Do something about it. Now, chapter 19. This begins with um, a, 
reiteration of some of the Ten Commandments, and so uh, begins with obedience towards God. Notice again who's speaking is Moses, right? Mm -hmm. The first command is in regard to dedication to God, and its purpose is indicative of all the commandments uh, and laws of God. He says, be this way because I am. Hello? This first command is in regard to dedication to God. In other words, holiness. That's what dedication is. That's what holiness is, is dedication. This first command is in regard to dedication to God, and its purpose is indicative of all of the other commands and laws. Be this way because I'm this way. I am the Lord your God. So this clarifies that the goal of the law was to produce the character of God and his people. Be this way because I'm this way. Is everybody tracking with me? Does that make sense? Yeah. So you notice because we have a God that doesn't change, you, you realize even when the covenant changed, God remained the same. Yeah. So under the new covenant, guess what God still wants? He wants his people to be just like he is. Right? Yeah. So the goal hasn't changed, has it? Right. His goal in the old covenant was be this way because I am. When Jesus came, died, and rose again, and the new covenant came, now we have the power to keep that command, and God is still saying, be holy because I am. Yes. Isn't that also written in the New Testament? Yes, it is. Absolutely. Yes, it is. Where do you think that New Testament writer got that information from? Uh -huh. The Old Testament. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Why? Because clearly it's still relevant. It still applies to the Christian, doesn't it? Yeah. So he says, be holy. That's the first <laughs> command, verse 2. Be holy as God is holy. The word holy, again, means, um, means different, unique, not common, not profane. Okay? Yes. Common is a neutral word. Profane is a negative word. He's saying, I, don't want, I certainly don't want you to be profane, but neither do I want you to be neutral, common. Stephen gives a good example of that either last week or on Sunday when he was talking, when um, mentioned um, uh, in the book of Revelation where Jesus said, if you're lukewarm, that would be neutral. I will puke you out of my mouth. Right? There is no middle ground here. I want you to be different. I want you to be unique in all the earth. Why? Because I'm unique. And, and what does holiness, what does his uniqueness require? It requires dedication to God. Yes. So dedication and the uniqueness that springs out of that are hand in glove as to the meaning of holiness. Okay? Now, this command is mentioned first both in order and priority. It is the basis upon which all the other commands are made and kept. In other words... If you are not being dedicated to God, and if you are not separating yourself and making yourself unique from all the people around the earth, there's no way in the world you could keep these other commands. You, if you've got to do that, and that be the foundation on your feet that allows you to do the others. It's a foundational command. Amen? Yeah. So, again, this, this uh, discredits the false teaching that the tradition, customs, and laws of the Old Testament Jewish community were borrowed or based upon other nations. They were, in fact, holy, unique, different, completely uncommon. They were a revelation of God himself. Now, verse 3, commandment number 2. Each of you is to respect his mother and his father. Both this and all the other commands have a different reason given for it than the first one. The first one is, be this way because I am, right? The second one... The second one, he says, essentially, because I told you so. I'm the Lord your God. The reason why you keep the first one is because that's my character. The reason why you keep the second one is because I am the creator who happens to also be your master. In other words, this is the parent saying, because I told you so. That's why. That's essentially the only reason he's offering. By the way, it's the only one he really has to offer. He doesn't owe me anything. <laughs> Isn't it true? So each of you is to respect his mother and father because I said so. Now this word respect means respectful awe. Now regardless of how good 
kind or loving a parent may be, or not be, but even if they are good, kind, and loving, to keep this, re this command requires seeing one's parents as an extension of the person and the authority of God himself. Otherwise, you will base your respect on familiarity and simple general respect. But this is to be respect that's based upon awe. There's only one thing in the entire earth that should inspire awe in a human being, and that's their creator. Awe, or awesome, is a word that really belongs to God alone, for he, the only, he is the only one that fits the definition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nothing else fits that definition. So when I have respect unto my mother and my father, notice this is not just the father, right? right. You have respect for both of your parents, amen? Mm -hmm. God's very strong on this, right? And his reason is because I said so. I put them in the position they're in. Now, God did not make them a good or a bad parent. That was their choice. Are you following? Yeah. But that they are a parent and that they are in authority in your life, God set that up. Nobody else did. God could have just as easily had your spirit put into a Chinese baby on the other side of the planet. He chose to put you in the body he did that was put together by the union of the parents that he chose for you. Hello? Yeah. Did he make them good parents or bad parents? No. God doesn't choose that. Are you following what I'm saying? This is another way we can get off track. Don't think because God gave you the parents he did that he chose to make them bad or good. Those were independent choices of their own. But at the same time, there's something intrinsic about those people that can train you towards the character of God better than anybody else on this planet. And God put them as authority over you for that reason. Are you following? Yeah. And so God says, respect them because I place them in authority over you. That's why you respect them. And you respect them with awe. Oh, it should make you almost tremble. Not because they're so great. They might be great. They might be terrible. But terrible or great is not the basis of the awe. The authority is the, is the, is the basis of the, of the awe. And that authority comes from the throne. Yes. Not the person. Amen? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay? This is why God takes it so serious. Because he says, I'm telling you, if you do not keep, the, uh, keep this command, even in a small way, your life is going to be shortened. The promise that comes along with it is if you honor your mother and father all the days of your life, he said, I will prolong your days. Yeah. And remember at the end of every time he says this, for I'm the Lord your God. Yeah. I said so. This is the reason. If you want to dishonor your parents, I'm going to cut your life short. Yeah. Because to dishonor them is to dishonor me. Right? Yeah. But if you want to honor them, I'll make your life long. Well, that, yes. that's, what do you think that says to an agenda, entire generation that despises authority? No wonder there are more children deaths going on in our generation than probably ever asked before. I'm not talking about pure numbers. I'm talking about percentages. Yes. Right? Yes. But children despise authority today. Yes. And they speak against and they rail against their parents. Yes. They take their parents to court. Yes. And God's like, this should never happen. I don't care how bad they are. Both this and the other commands, like I said, have different reasons uh, than the first one. It is based upon God's um, uh, lordship over us. Regardless of how good or kind a loving parent, uh, parent is, this is the way God expects us to be. Um, now, the third, uh, um, let's see, yeah, the third command is keep my Sabbaths. Now, this one is a little bit tricky because I could find no specific justification for this Sabbath appearing in the plural as opposed to in the singular. So he could be talking about the Sabbath day, or he could be talking about any of the other Sabbaths that happen. There are Sabbaths of weeks. There's a Sabbath year. There are um, Sabbaths that happen within feasts. There's all kinds of Sabbaths. But let's just say, if, God, if there's a Sabbath, God made it. Isn't that true? So we don't pick which ones to honor. We just keep all of them. Right? So, I, you know, so I'm going to take it to mean keep all of them. Not just the one, 
but all of them. This command is immediately linked to the honoring of one's parents in that this was a means of showing respect towards God as your spiritual father. In the Hebrew, it's pretty clear that these two were said in one breath. Honor your mother, your father, and honor the Sabbaths, because I'm the Lord your God. In other words, give respect to your natural parents and give respect to me as your spiritual parent. And the way you do that is honor my Sabbaths. No wonder there's also a huge kickback in the body of Christ today of saying, well, the Sabbath doesn't matter. That was all Old Testament. Yes, Gary. Just a real quick thing about Sabbaths and Sabbaths. Uh -huh. At the end of this handout, I'll give you guys later, because it relates to the feast later, but also to this. Mm -hmm. um, in Leviticus, of course, the number seven is very important. Every seventh day was the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Every seventh year was the sabbatical year. Yep. Every seven times seven years what was the year of Jubilee. That's right. Pentecost was seven weeks after the Passover. Mm -hmm. Every seventh month of the year were the Feast of Tabernacles, ta the trumpets, the tabernacles, and atonement. Mm -hmm. Pentecost lasted seven days. Passover lasted seven days. This book of Leviticus, like Revelation, is built around a series of seven. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, uh, so clearly it is important. Uh, again, people have all kinds of reasons why they're exempt. But, you know, that's okay. I'm not going to argue with you. Be exempt. And, and you're also exempt from the blessing. And that's fine. If you want to be stupid, be stupid. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and honor it anyway, right? Uh, now, uh, verse 4. Command, this is also verse 4. is command number 4 as well. And that is, do not turn to idols or make a cast image of gods for yourself. Now, this one's kind of self-explanatory, so I really didn't go into any depth at all. Now, the last part is regarding fellowship with God. When you offer a peace offering, which is an offering of fellowship with God, it must be voluntary and because your heart was fully in it. We already know this because he said this before, hasn't he? But it's obviously important enough to repeat it. He's repeating it here. He also said, once offered, do not delay in eating the meal. Do it that day or the next. If you wait until the third day, um, what, um, uh, I'm sorry, if you wait until the third day, what was done for fellowship now becomes an abomination to me, and it will not be accepted. And if you decide to go in and eat it after the third day, you will bear your guilt and be cut off from Israel. It was a big deal. It was a big deal. God took, I, I want you to notice that don't, again, don't fall into the trap of thinking, well, God was just sitting there coming up with new ideas of ways to torture us with silly laws that don't make any sense. No, no, no. This actually had a reason behind it. God, remember, why did Jesus come? Did he just come to deal with sin or did he come to bring life? Bring he came to bring life, union. That's what the peace offering was all about. It was all about fellowship with God. That's what it was about. And it's like, you know, don't offer it and then act like, well, I'll have fellowship with you by eating the meal when I get around to it. That's disrespectful. Right? It's saying, I love you, but I don't have time for you. I'll offer you the, I'll cook the meal, but I'm not going to eat it with you. Hello? God's like, no, no, no. I'll, I'll let you put it off to the second day, but by the third day, I've already been offended and it's done. It's over with. Right? Now, now, you weren't over with. He's just like, I'm not going to accept it anymore. That, that sacrifice was an abomination. But after it was an abomination, if you decide to eat it then, now it's, a, it's an act of treason against God and you're cut off from his people. Period. Are you following? Yes. So this, is, this was an important command, not because of the food itself, not because of the sacrifice itself, but because of what it represented. Amen? God said, don't be lagging in diligence when it comes to do with intimacy with me. Can you see why that's a major problem in Manti County? That we are so casual about our relationship with God. He takes it pretty serious, doesn't he? Yeah. It's now, everywhere, not just here. No, you're right. But there are certain areas where it's much worse, and this is one of them. Now, um, loving your neighbor. The next set of things, commands, are all about loving your neighbor. Um, it says, leave the corners of your field for the poor, the stranger, the orphan, the widow. That's about loving your neighbor, isn't it? Yeah. 
He says, don't steal. Well, that's loving your neighbor. Don't act with deception or a lie. Well, that's loving your neighbor. Do not attach my name to a promise whereby you are swearing falsely. Such is to profane my name. It's also not loving your neighbor because you're misrep you're bringing God's name in on a promise, on a vow that you don't keep. Right? Do not oppress or charge too much or pay too little. Pay what you owe when you owe it and do not make them wait. This is a big deal to God. Do not oppress nor charge too much, but on the other end, don't pay too little. Right? Yeah. Don't, do, don't go to a garage sale and see uh, something that you know is worth $500, a person selling it for 10 cents because they don't know any better. Right. You just lied against your neighbor. Right. right. You just played part of the deception. Hello? Yes. Now, if you bring it to their attention and say, you know what? I don't think you realize that this thing's worth a lot more money yes. than exactly. you're charging for it. They're like, I don't care. It has got a lot of grief associated with it. I want it out of my life. Now, fine. Pay whatever they say. Yeah. Now, now you're not living a lie. Are you following? Right. Exactly. But before, you're playing into deception. Right. This is not about their honor. This is about yours. Right. Amen? Right. He says, um, do not run your mouth against someone who cannot even hear you and so can't defend themselves against your words. Mm -hmm. Do not attempt to trip or abuse someone who cannot see. Both of these commands imply not only the prohibition against doing evil, but include an admonition to actively do good and lend aid to this person. Again, it doesn't show up as easily in the English, but it's actually right there in the Hebrew. It's not just saying don't do the evil, but do the good. Yeah. Don't just, don't just not trip a guy that's blind walking down the street thinking that's funny, but instead help him. Yes. Right? Yes. Don't mock and make fun of a person who's deaf and can't hear you and, and think it's funny because they can't defend themselves. You're evil if you do something like that. Yes. Right? Yes. Come to their aid. Come to their defense. Yes. Amen? Yes. Now, when making de decisions... Do not respect persons. Do not give an advantage to the poor or the rich. Treat them both equally. Yes. Don't go to the poor guy and give him more because he's poor. Don't go to the rich guy and give him less because he's rich. Give, if you're going to give, give the same amount to both. Don't respect them because of where they came from. Hello? Yeah. He says, uh, um, such, would be an undue, such would be an undue advantage and would not be fair. You must not talk against others nor gossip. Do not lie against someone else. Do not even spread a suspicious rumor and so ruin a person's reputation and livelihood as a result. This command is to be understood as by bearing a false testimony whereby his blood is in danger of being shed when he's truly innocent. That's one of the ways this is understood. It also means by being silent and not hearing a testimony for him whereby the shedding of his innocent blood might have been prevented. Right. In other words, he's saying, have skin in the game. Don't walk into way and say, ah, oh, that's none of my business. I don't want to get involved. You are involved. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> By this law, one is bound to do everything he can to preserve the life of his neighbor. When it is by, when it, I'm sorry, when it is by any means in danger by drowning or by thefts or by wild beasts or by external judgment of others, you come to their aid. Yes. Can you see how that's, it's much bigger than the words make it sound like. Oh, yeah. When it says, don't just, in other words, he's not just saying don't just talk about people and gossip against them and pro, being proactive in destroying them, but if anything comes against them, come to their aid. Right. Be a first responder. That's right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You're not just, God's not just saying don't be a cause of their problem. He's also saying be a cause of their aid. Right. Amen. Yes. The, and how do I know this? Not only is it kind of embedded in the Hebrew language, but when Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes gave the meaning of the words, he went steps further than the words make it sound like, right? Mm -hmm. 
He's saying, you know, I know that you've heard it said, do not murder your brother, but I'm telling you, don't even hate your brother in your heart. Because if you do, you have killed him. Right? right? Don't, you know, don't just don't, um, don't commit adultery, but don't even desire the person in your heart. Otherwise, you've already done it. Don't, don't just, just don't cut, don't just don't, don't steal, but don't even watch what that person has in your heart. Because if you have, you've already stolen from them. You see what he's saying? He's going proactive. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Yes, Terry. Just going the same long lines when he went to describe what a neighbor was, he told the Good Samaritan. That's right. And yeah. the Good Samaritan. Whoever happens to be nearby. Above and beyond. To deal That's with right. Somebody. He had no idea who he was, and he didn't just give him a pat on the back and say, I hope you feel better. He picked him up and cleaned him up and paid and, his way. And, and also yeah, told the guy if, they, if he incurs any other debt, I'll pay it. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Right. And this is doing the right thing. Also, you know, if a soldier, a Roman soldier, because the Roman soldier in, in, in latter days, not during this day, because Rome didn't even exist at that point, but it, later in Jesus' life, um, if a Roman soldier um, stopped you in the street and said, carry my sword and carry my coat, uh, cloak and carry this, you were obligated by Roman law to do that for one mile. Yes. And it says, if a Roman soldier, if, if, well, it didn't use the word Roman soldier, I think, in the original text, but it was understood. Yeah. Yeah. If someone asks you to carry their cloak one mile, he says, take it two. Yeah. As a Christian, you always go the extra mile. Yeah. Go above and beyond what anybody else would have done. Yeah. And, and, and I'll, let me just go ahead and throw this out there as well. Jesus says, because that's Jesus' command. The command of man is carry it one mile. My command is your master is if they ask for one, give them two miles. Yeah. Right? Which by extension means if they ask for three, give them six. Right? right? right. Double whatever they ask for. Right. Right? right? And Jesus said, if you only do what I'm commanding you, you're still not worthy of any praise. At the end of the day, you've just done what it was required to do. Right. You're still not worthy of praise. Most Christians would feel like they were really worthy of praise, and God really needs to just buy me a car because I went a mile and a half, and the guy only asked for a mile. And Jesus is like, no, no, if you just went two miles, I still don't know you, Jack. You're just barely doing what I asked you to do. A, a, a servant is praiseworthy when he go beyond and above and beyond what his master is required of him. Amen. Yes. Uh huh. Even the apostles in the end, mm -hmm. when they cast their crowns, mm -hmm. say, "We've only done what mm -hmm. was required of us." Yes, exactly. Amen. That's right. <laughs> so uh, now, um, do not hate your brother in your heart. Do not fail to come to their aid with encouragement away from sin, especially if it is known and persistent. If you see your brother in sin and you know it, and you know it's a persistent sin, you go to them. You encourage them out of it. This is the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. He says, this is a means of not hating, but rather loving your brother, much like a parent who loves their child and therefore <laughs> will discipline them. True love will not allow another to continue in a way that will hurt them without intervention. Hello? Yeah. Do not take advantage, do not take revenge out on anyone or continue to hold a grudge against anyone, but rather actively love them. Out of this command, Jesus counseled a young man, by the way, in Luke the 12th chapter, verse 13 through 21. This is very likely the basis of what Jesus said, uh, the, the basis or the reason why Jesus gave this advice to this young man. I'll read it again. It says, do not take revenge out on anyone, but to continue to hold, nor continue to hold a grudge against anyone, but rather love them. Jesus said in Luke 12, verse 13 through 21, someone from the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus turned to him and said, friend, he, who appointed me as a judge and an arbiter over you and your estate? He then told him, watch out and be on guard against all greed, because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Yeah. Notice Jesus took the pressure off the brother that was doing the wrong and put it on the pressure of the guy who was demanding his rights. Right. He said, the problem is not your brother, the problem is yours. Yeah. Paul would later on say it this way. You ought rather to be defrauded. Right. Give it up. If, you're, if your brother will not divide the inheritance fairly with you, he, if you had the right heart, he couldn't steal from you. Give it to him. Right? Right? right. 
But a Christian today would feel like they are perfectly in their legal and moral rights to take a brother to court yes. over inheritance. Yes. And Paul said, you know, the very fact that you've got to bring this up is a failure on your part. Yeah. I can't believe I even have to mention it. You ought to allow yourself to be defrauded. Yeah. Amen? And what did it come out of? Very likely this passage right here. Wow. Jesus was drawing from this. You're not loving him. You're more concerned about your rights than you are about your brother. Yes. Amen? Yeah. And now, did, is Jesus saying that this guy is wrong? No. In fact, Jesus' is a fair parable nicely fit both of them. <laughs> He said, don't get caught up in possessions because a man's value in his life is not in what he, what, what he owns and what he possesses, right? right. So right. that means you ought to let go of it and your brother's wrong from trying to cleave onto it. Right. You're both wrong, right. right? And I don't have your brother's ear because he's not asking the question. You are. Yeah. So my advice is to you. You change. Yeah. Let him have it. Amen. Let him have it, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, May, um, he, said, he also brings up something that's a little bit off, a little odd, and that is mixing of animals, mixing of seed, and mixing clothes, uh, cloths. Um, that's mentioned here, and it's not alone in the Old Testament. It's mentioned in other places. Many reasons have been suggested for these prohibitions, but I believe that the most obvious is that it was intended as a visual reminder of separation between kinds, mixture, um, mixtures of Israel with other nations in marriage or in religion, Holy with the unholy, the clean with the unclean, the pure with the defiled, the secular with the religious. I think it was intended to be an external thing that they kept that was just illustrating a point. Now, there are people that will tell you that there were, um, <coughs> that there were um, like in this particular case, um, it was said that there were practices such as these among pagan nations, which are said to have been considered magic. In other words, other nations would sow multiple seeds in one field and they did it because they believed it had a magic effect. Maybe there was. I can't find any proof of that anywhere. Um, there might be, but I can't find it. Um, and, and certainly, God definitely wanted them to be different than the nations around them. So if anybody was doing this as a way of pagan worship, no doubt God was saying don't do it for that very reason. Amen? But one way or the other, God's making a big deal of separating things. Keeping things distinct. Amen? Which points back to holy, separated consecrated, dedicated, different. Amen? Yeah. Now, of course, it goes on the other end when you start when you're talking about inside the family. That you want separate. Do not have intercourse inside the family. Keep that separate. So I think that when you look at this one chapter, he's showing there are areas and there's ways where diversity is a good thing, but there's areas where uh, where it isn't so good, where you don't keep things together, right? Are you following? Yeah. Yes. So, and I think he's just, he's, I think he's using these to illustrate a point. Is everybody with me? Yeah. Does that make sense? Now, now, can I say that categorically? I know that's the only reason why he's bringing it up. No, I, I can't tell you that because I don't know. And it's not telling us. So, all I can say is God said it, so, we, you, you know, they just were supposed to do it, right? Now, he went on to say, one was not to have sex with a female servant who was betrothed to another man. If you remember back when we were looking at the book of Exodus, um, that... If a, if a young if a if a father were to sell his daughter into endangered um, slavery, in other words, to serve as what would you and I would have probably called a maid, mm -hmm. and she was on staff full time to work for this other guy, and it helped to pay off a family debt, then um, sometimes the person that received her as his servant would also pay a debt to the father saying, I'm going to go ahead and keep this girl and she will become my wife at the end of this contract or I'm going to give her to my son as, my, as his wife or something like that. She was betrothed. She wasn't married yet because the contract wasn't up yet, right? But at the end of the contract, she would be given a husband, which in Jewish society, that was an honor. This girl didn't feel like she was being abused. She had a future and a hope, a secure one at that. And she was the salvation of her family. She was honored by this right. because she wasn't being selfish. Right. Her world wasn't about herself. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Christians today would cry foul. But that's because their world is all about themselves. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. But this woman would not have thought that way. It would have never even entered her mind. So what he's saying is if a person were to go in there and either entice her 
into sexual um, intercourse that she gives into, which more than likely is what this is about, because there's another law, which we've already read about, that if a woman were being raped, she is to cry out. And if she, is, if she does cry out, then she is not held guilty. Amen? Right. But if, she is taking, if, she, if this is far away from another place where she could not cry out and anybody hear her, then she's still not held guilty. God believes the best of her. Okay? But um, so clearly, because that's not being brought up here, this must be consensual. Are you following? Uh, this just only requires just common sense. Okay? Because it doesn't bring up the other, this must be consensual. Right? Now, he says, one is not to have sexual intercourse with a female servant who's betrothed to another man. If they engage in sex, they are both guilty and must be punished. Now, the King James is incorrect in that it says she must be scourged first because there is nothing in the text that singles her out as the only one punished. That's not in the Hebrew text at all. Okay? So she's not being singled out. Number two, the word, tra the word translated as scourged actually just means punished. It doesn't mean beaten with a whip. It just means punished. So it is almost equally possible that the punishment was financial and that the man who engaged her insects must pay a ransom fee, possibly because she would very likely no longer be engaged and no profit could be made from her anymore and, mar and her marriage would have been lost. Right. Exactly. Okay? Yeah. So if one person was being singled out, probably the man would have been. And he would, the punishment would have been a financial one. And he also would have had to offer a, um, a, um, a sacrifice, as we read, a trespass offering to the Lord, a ram, and that would wind up being his forgiveness. He would be forgiven. The reason why I kind of lean towards the idea that if any one person was going to be punished here, it would have been the man. Um, I actually believe both of them were. But it's because of the fact that the thing that was being offered to God as a trespass offering was a ram, which represents protection and safety. And remember, God was always looking to protect his women, his daughters. Amen? She, now, now granted, she almost certainly had to engage in this Wolfly of her own. Yeah. But at the same time, she lost more than he did. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He offers up a sacrifice and his life goes on as normal. Yeah. But now, very likely, no one's going to marry this chick. Right. Exactly. She just lost her future. Right. Right? Right. And God's like, you know what? You owe a ram for that, son, because of the fact that, uh, you know, what you just did, you worked against her protection and her safety. More than likely, she would have been absorbed back into her father's household with dishonor. Because it also would have brought dishonor on her father, right. as well as her owner at the time, right. her master. Exactly. Now, trees were uh, planted could not be harvested until three years uh, of fruit had passed. On the fourth year, the fruit was given to the Lord, and on the fifth year, it was yours to eat. That was a standard statute throughout of all of Israel. Do not eat blood. Pretty clear statement, right? Also shows up in the New Testament what the Jews told the Gentiles. Amen? Don't eat blood. No pra it also says, do not practice divination or fortune telling or any magic or witchcraft or even believe in omens. Now, by an omen, what it essentially mean was like a raven landing near you. And some people freak out and they say, oh, that's a bad omen. Or stepping on a crack on concrete or breaking a mirror. And people think, oh, bad things. This is, don't believe in that garbage. Yeah. Don't believe in that. That's superstition. It's wrong. Don't believe it. Yeah. Okay? Do not believe these things, and do not consult people who tell you that they'll tell you the future, right? If you do this, you're in big trouble, right? Yeah. He says, don't, now this next one was kind of weird. Essentially, in modern terms is, don't get a bowl cut. Yeah, don't get a bowl cut. Don't stick a bowl on top of your head and trim all the way around it. He's talking to the men. Okay. Now, there was a reason for this. It is most probable because this was uh, given because of the fact that it was a very, very real fashion that had been learned by the Israelites in Egypt, and the ancient Egypts did this as a type of religious worship. Their dark locks were cut short and shaven with great neatness, so that what remained on the crown appeared in the form of a like a, a circle around their head, like like they got a bowl cut. And they would also trim the corners of their beards. Now, this kind of uh, kofir was, uh, had a highly idolatrous meaning to it, and it was adopted 
um, with some slight variations by almost all idolaters in the ancient world. And so this was not so much because God cared how you cut your hair as much as he wants you to be different from everybody else. And you know, Jews who still do this, they still are pretty different than everybody else. They definitely, you don't have to wonder who is a practicing Jew that's a man. They all look the same. They got the same kind of beard cut, got the same kind of hair cut, don't they? Those weird curly cues that come down on the side, they stand out like a sore thumb. Yeah. God's like, good, that's what I want. I want you different than everyone around you. Yeah. People don't have to wonder who you worship and who you belong to because the very way you trim your hair cries out, God owns me. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Which is why Paul on the other end, because remember, God's not just about don't do this. He's about proactive do this. Which is why we have some proactive commands in the New Covenant where Paul was telling people in his day, you know what, women, if it's a shame for you to have a shade of short hair, then you need to do this. If, if you're in a society for a man that, that having long hair that, that identifies you as being something that is not Christian, then cut your dang hair. Right? Yeah. You, as a Christian, stand out from the people around you. If it is a custom of the world to do something, and by wearing this or doing this, you look like one of them, don't do it. Do it. Period. Period. Right? It's very clear. God wants you to stand out. Amen? He doesn't want you to be just like everyone else. Now, he also says no cuts and that no tattoos. Um, part of this message, uh, of the, uh, part of the message to us today is that, like I just said, what our culture thinks and how they perceive things is very important. If some clothing or jewelry or body decoration would associate us with a pagan world, it should not be practiced and done. <coughs> It is, a, it is difficult to, uh, uh, it's a difficult line to draw because the standards of cultures are always changing. I mean, what, what's it, what, there was a day when a tattoo would have marked you as being a very loose person, probably hanging out in a very bad crowd. And it wasn't even all that long ago. Now, it doesn't really have that stereotype. Are you following? Mm -hmm. So I, I and, and, and when he's talking about these markings, He's not talking what we traditionally, I don't think, it's traditionally what we would call a tattoo. He was talking about the kind of marking, like you've seen um, African tribes that have piercings and they have body markings, but all of them have a meaning that are associated and rooted in their pagan idolatry. And it's like, I don't want you doing anything that makes you look like you're one of them. Are you following? Right. Does that put limits on your freedom? Yes. yes. And that should be just fine with you because you love me more than that. Yes. Amen? Yes. You love me more than you love what you call freedom, yes. right? Yes. So he also says, don't prostitute your daughters. You're like, you know, you have to tell people that? Yeah, and that day you did. And that day, it, yeah, you really did. Remember, what were we dealing with in, uh, with Lot, a righteous man? Yeah. He was ready to send his daughters out in the street. He says, well, have your way with my daughters. They're all virgins. But keep these guys I just met safe. You know, I mean, in today's world, even a sinner would look at you like you had two heads if you did something like that. But they, had, they didn't have any idea of this. There was no law, and everything, right and wrong was what you thought was right in your own eyes. Right? Aren't you glad the law came? Yeah. The line is your friend. Yeah. <laughs> I got news for you. Women today that buck the law, the Old Testament law, they don't know what that has done to protect them. Because you realize the fact that that is not practiced in today's world is largely because of the fact that we founded this nation on biblical principles. That's right. Other nations, they wouldn't think anything of it. No, really. So we need to be careful what we buck against, right? That's exactly. <laughs> we have to be very careful. Keep the Sabbath and respect my holy place. Do not consult mediums or necromancers or soothsayers or familiar spirits. Show respect for your over people older than you are. Let them speak first. Stand as they enter a room. Open the door for them. Carry heavy loads for them. Show respect. That's what God's saying. Amen. Did he say, no, only show it if they've earned it. He said, no, no, no. If they got gray hair and they're older, show respect. Right. Period. This was not a request. It was a command. Right. And he knows it wasn't a conditional one. The only condition was if they're old. Right. That was the condition. 
right? Let's be careful with this. Yeah. Um, uh, show respect for your elders uh, that are older than you. Um, uh, uh, like I said a minute ago, let them speak first. You see this in the book of Job. Elihu was a young man, and yet the wisdom of God rested in him, not in those that were older than him. And yet, though he knew his counsel was right and theirs was wrong, he kept his mouth shut. And he said, the reason why was because I said in my heart, wisdom should speak at first, and, the, and people of, of old age and gray hair should have the floor before I do. And he was right. Yeah. Even though their counsel was wrong, his actions were right. Because he wasn't honoring their bad counsel. He was honoring, honoring the fact that they were older than he was. Mm. Elihu was right in what he did. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Now, do not treat a stranger with difficulty. In other words, be nice. This is pretty clear advice. Be nice. Yeah. And, remember, and I love how every time God tells them about how to treat a stranger, he always does this. He says, because you remember how it felt for you when you were a stranger in Egypt. Yes. Keep that in your head. Don't ever forget. Right? Yeah. Don't ever forget how it felt for you to be the guy picked on. Right? Yeah. And let that be a guide so that you don't treat other people unfairly and, mm -hmm. uh, and unrighteously. Amen? Mm -hmm. And the last thing in chapter 19 was don't cheat others by false weights or balances. If anything, give good measure. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If someone's coming in, uh, to a pawn shop and they're trying to get money for gold, don't tweak the scale so it looks like what's there is lighter than it is. Yeah. Have, have Make sure that your, 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 your scales are balanced properly. That's what the Bible means when he hates a false balance. He doesn't like people that lie. Lies are an abomination to God. He hates it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Don't cheat. In fact, if anything, if you're going to fudge, fudge in their favor. That's right. right? Good measure. Press down. Shaking together. Running over. That's your job. That's right. But don't you don't you be stingy. Don't you don't let my people ever be stingy. Amen? Yeah. God is not for stinginess. He hates it. Now, chapter 20 is real simple. So I'm going to speed through this because really it's just telling you the results of this is what you get if you break any of the stuff I brought up earlier, right? If anyone sacrifices their descendants to Molech, which is essentially another god, the people who are, are to the people, all of Israel is to stone that person to death. If you fail to do this, he says, I will cut them off from their people. He says, I will also cut off anyone who turns to mediums or any other thing for advice, counsel, or to learn the future from anyone or anything else other than me. I will cut them off from my people. If anyone curses either of their parents, they are to be put to death, and I will cut them off from their people. In other words, before they die, they're not part of the covenant anymore. For any of the sexual practices that I commanded you not to do, the one who does it is to be killed. If it involves marrying a girl and her mother, you will be burned at the stake. If a person takes a near of kin, they are to be cut off from their people and they will bear their own guilt. Sex with a woman on her period, they're both to be cut off from Israel, but they're not killed. Sex with an uncle or aunt or a sibling or a, um, a sibling's mate, will bear their guilt, and they will die childless. God will see to it that they get no offspring. The last things are, keep everything I've commanded you, so that the land will not vomit you out, lest I abhor you as I did the other nations. You are to be to me alone. If anyone who is a medium or has a familiar spirit, they are to be killed with stones, and their blood will rest upon their own hands. That's chapter 20 in a nutshell. There really isn't a whole lot. I mean, I could stretch that out, but not by much. That's really all it says. Okay? So, uh, those are those chapters. Any any thoughts or questions or anything further? You guys want to add or ask or whatever? I may or may not have an answer, but you can ask it. So he's got her notes, so I'm, I'm going to wait. <laughs> what? Well, Mom? Well, 
She was asking something first. What are you saying? I just said I may have a question to you later. If I may. That's fine. Sure. <laughs> Did you have something, Terry? Was there anything that came up in your study about Molech? He was the one that uh, that they would sacrifice their children to in the fire. And uh, but it was it was more than likely the reason why he brought Molech up is because it was a common issue at the time. But it was essentially just like the whole telling the Gentiles don't commit sexual immorality also included in it things he didn't mention, like don't lie, don't cheat, don't kill. Um, obviously, God was not for them sacrificing their children to any God, but he just happened to bring up Moab. So, uh, and that was actually an ongoing problem in Israel. They, they had a tendency to go back to Molech several times. So that was a problem.